All good. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ben Jorgensen. I'm a project manager at Sustainable Business Hub and coordinator of the TechBridge project. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar on energy and water management challenges in New York. Uh, some background about our initiative. Uh, our, our main goal here is to uh, accelerate European innovators into North America and secure uh, collaboration agreements with US and Canadian counterparts there. Uh, we are financed by the European Commission and we have five partners from five countries. So in addition to Sustainable Business Hub in Sweden, we have Clean in Denmark, Water Alliance in the Netherlands, uh, Lombardy Energy and uh, Environment Cluster in uh, Italy, and Avacen in Spain. Uh, so over the course of our two-year project, we're going to organize five rounds of matchmaking between European SMEs and uh, potential partners in New York, as well as four other regions in Canada and the United States. And the process starts with a webinar like this. So you will join us today to learn a bit more about energy and water challenges uh, of some very interesting stakeholders in New York City. Uh, once this webinar closes, uh, applications will open for one-on-one -on -one meetings with these stakeholders. So we will have a selection process together with these partners and choose the most relevant SMEs to participate in these meetings. And after this first round, we'll have another selection process to make sure that it's only the most relevant companies that uh, continue the process. Uh, towards the end of next year, companies that have made it through this process will also have the opportunity to apply for co-financing of travel costs to visit partners in New York and take things to the next step. Uh, so I hope you all pay attention today and think about which stakeholders you want to meet with. Um, you will have uh, an opportunity to uh, engage in a Q&A with all of them, and I'll explain that a little bit uh, later on. But this is the agenda for today. So we'll start with uh, Will Sibia of Herbs Urban Systems. Then we'll hear from Jared Rodriguez and Monica Ridgway of the New York State Energy R&D Authority, as well as Michael Izzo of Heinz and Connor Uzri of the Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, that group will be followed by Will Marin of Con Edison. And then we'll take a short break before moving on to some uh, public sector stakeholders, starting with uh, Suzanne Desroche of the New York City Office of Resiliency and Office of Sustainability, uh, Jennifer McDowell of the Department of Environmental Protection, and more specifically their Resource Recovery Program. Then we'll hear from Miki Urasaka of also of the DEP uh, with a focus on green infrastructure, and we'll finish off with uh, Rebecca Zakowitz of the Citywide administrative services. Uh, so please remember when you're listening to all of this, only European SMEs unfortunately are eligible for the one-on-one -on -one meetings and travel support that we offer in this project. Um, if you're not sure if you're an SME, please take a look at this definition. You can also find it online. If you have any questions for the stakeholders, uh, please write them in the Q&A box at the bottom and we will uh, then read those questions out to the presenters. And for those of you who are not an SME or not a European company, please just try to listen. Uh, the main focus here is on those companies. And for all of our panelists, uh, thank you very much for being here. And please remember to keep yourself muted when you're not presenting. And with that, we will jump straight into our presentation. So uh, Will, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I just try to share my screen here. Hi, do you see my screen, Ben? Just want to confirm. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, to everyone in Eurozone, and good morning to everyone who's joining us from the New York region. And just a brief about herbs. So we are a commercial arm to the export platform under Swedish industry. And what we essentially do, we try to get this knowledge, technology, finance, and insurance products combined to give a solution to as close as possible to the end user. 
And one of the main reasons is that since we know we have the technology that is proven robust and reliable in the Nordic countries that can be exported to different parts of the world, we try to find gaps in the system why these things can't be exported or what is hindering it. So that's where we come in. And we have a sort of a multi-factor approach where we work with different stakeholders to de-risk the solution. And in that way, we also enable the investors a lot of comfort. So you can see us also as a platform where we enable the investors to come in and invest in solutions that are transparent, secure, and are quite reliable. One of the main reasons in New York that attracted us about two, three years ago was essentially the regulatory drive that was creating a market initiative that is essentially unprecedented that we've seen before. And we have the solutions that we could deploy in New York. Of course, there were gaps, but that would give a scale which is pretty impressive. So we see the work that is done by NYSERDA. We've been very fortunate to be able to be in touch with NYSERDA and also have partnered with Heinz in different projects. So to see the scale is pretty amazing. And I think that gives an opportunity for a lot of SMEs, small tech innovative companies to take advantage of this drive and this ambition by New York City to decarbonize itself over the course of time. One of, the, one of the main drivers for us is to give the solution to create a market drive because once the market takes these solutions on board, that's the easiest way we can drive the transformation and drive the decarbonization. So during a course of time, we've found many uh, partners that are aligned with these things and I will without taking more time, I think it'll be very interesting for the audience to listen to how NYSERDA has worked and how real estate developers, in this case, Heinz, are thinking to take this challenge and what processes they have created. Thank you. Ben, I think over to. Yeah, please go ahead, Monica. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Will. I think that was a great segue and introduction to my portion of the presentation. So my name is Monica Ridgway and I'm a project manager on the Advanced Efficiency Solutions Team at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, which is essentially New York State's Department of Energy. Um, prior to joining NYSERDA, I worked for an energy efficiency startup here in New York City called Radiator Labs and designed innovation, clean tech innovation programs at C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, where I worked with Henrik, um, Scott, and the rest of the clean team. So I'm really excited to be here today. Um, it's my pleasure to kick off this discussion by providing an overview of the regulatory landscape in New York State, as well as New York City which in our view creates strong market conditions to accelerate innovation and investment in the building sector and help make New York State a low carbon retrofit hub, serving really as an entry point into the broader US market for international solution providers, you know, as, as Will mentioned a bit earlier. So the two pieces of legislation that I want to highlight today um, are at the state and city level. First, at the state level, we have the New York State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or the CLCPA, which was signed into law in July 2019. The CLCPA sets the most aggressive um, greenhouse gas reduction goals of any major economy, codifying a series of clean energy targets and setting commitments to environmental justice and benefiting um, disadvantaged communities. So in numbers, you can see here on the slide, uh, many numbers, uh, but to call it a few. So we have an 85% reduction in economy-wide emissions by 2050, 100% zero emissions electricity by 2040, 
as well as other ambitious renewable generation, storage, and efficiency targets, including 22 million tons of carbon reduction through energy efficiency and electrification. And again, these have all been codified into law. So at the city level, which um, Will referred to earlier, we have the New York City Climate Mobilization Act, which also passed a little over a year and a half ago. And you know, the real estate community, sustainability community, uh, has had many conversations about this and it's really shifting the market. So the CMA consists of several climate laws um, that are designed to drastically cut carbon in New York City. And at the centerpiece of this legislation is the Local Law 97 or the buildings mandate, which requires all buildings over 25,000 square feet to meet ambitious climate reduction targets and imposes fines based on these limits beginning in 2024 and ramping up in 2030. And the legislation covers approximately 50,000 buildings and accounts for, which account for nearly 60% of the city building area. And we know that, you know, in New York City, cities account or buildings account for around two thirds of citywide carbon emissions. And so deep energy efficiency retrofits and electrification are absolutely essential to meeting our state and city level emission reduction targets. And you know, in our view poses a really incredible opportunity for the private sector to come in, innovate and implement the solutions and create jobs for New Yorkers. And we'll call this out, but an analysis by the Urban Green Council, which is you know, a, a great organization to go to. Um, I shared a link on this slide uh, for more information. Um, they have a lot of resources about the local law 97. Uh, and they show that if all buildings choose efficiency to meet their carbon goals, then the retrofit market opportunity in New York City could be over 20 billion by 2030 and create over 100,000 jobs by 2030. Um, so of course we need this investment now more than ever uh, to help us build back better in a post COVID world. So finally, I wanna call out just two programs that my team at NYSERDA has recently launched to help accelerate innovation in the building retrofit sector. NYSERDA runs many other programs. So I highly recommend that anyone who is interested in doing business in New York State to go to the link that I provided in this slide to look at all of our funding opportunities. But first, the Innovative Market Strategies Program is a $10 million grant program that seeks to fund market tests that demonstrate promising and novel approaches to scaling the adoption of energy efficiency and distributed energy resources across New York State with an emphasis on solutions that benefit low uh, and moderate income New Yorkers. And second, we recently launched the Empire Building Challenge, which is a $50 million public-private partnership to develop a new generation of high-rise, low-carbon buildings to combat climate change and create jobs for New Yorkers. The program funded the research project by Rocky Mountain Institute, which Connor Ustry will present today. Um, again, these are just two of the many funding opportunities. So please uh, go to our website and look at the other funding opportunities that are available. So with that, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Jared Rodriguez, who spearheaded the launch of the Empire Building Challenge to provide an overview of the program objectives, as well as some key areas of business opportunities that we see for um, the decarbonization of high-rise buildings. Hello, um, good morning from New York. <laughs> uh, Jared Rodriguez, I'm the principal of Emergent Urban Concepts, um, a sustainability uh, and urbanism advisory uh, firm. I was brought in to work with NYSERDA to develop the Empire Building Challenge. Uh, and I, I participate on the team with Monica um, and the rest of our team to design and launch the, the program, um, which is actually just launching now. We expect to announce our first cohort of real estate partners, um, hopefully in mid-January. So keep an eye out for that. So the, the aim of the Empire Building Challenge is to 
recruit best in class technology providers. So it's pretty appropriate that we're on this webinar with you this morning. Um, we're looking to attract and recruit best in class equipment manufacturers uh, globally, um, solution providers and other businesses to invest in business development, innovation uh, and product development to overcome what we see as, as pretty major barriers that are preventing New York's uh, tall and very large buildings from achieving carbon neutrality. Um, tall buildings in New York are uh, you know, unique. Uh, there are some very specific issues um, that, are, that are preventing these buildings from making appreciable gains in emissions reductions. Um, the, the real estate community um, was uh, very positive about our program. We had 38 Empire Building Challenge applications. Um, these included uh, submissions from some of the largest real estate commercial and multifamily owners um, in the world. Uh, the combined commitments to carbon neutrality um, were for at least 100 million square feet of residential and commercial space. And those carbon neutrality commitments were by or before 2035, um, which is really exciting. So we have a, we have a commercial and multifamily real estate industry that's um, aggressively pursuing emissions reductions and carbon neutrality targets uh, based on our program. Um, and based on a lot of research and discussion with these firms, um, we found that there's a, a good deal of um, limitation in what's available to, to these companies in the space of, of thermal storage um, and energy distribution innovation. Uh, and we think that these are these are key um, these are key areas where we need innovation in order to overcome some of our uh, decarbonization barriers. We're also really looking for novel business models, um, uh, deframing of, of risk, uh, and new financing models to to help these buildings um, move toward their their carbon neutrality targets. And from here, I'd like to pass it on to Connor from Rocky Mountain Institute. Actually, Mike, sorry, Michael Izzo <laughs> from Heinz, one of uh, one of the many large real estate firms in New York City. Michael, you have the microphone in mute. Yes, I do. Okay, thank um, you. Just wanted to start by introducing myself. Uh, Michael Izzo from Heinz, mainly working in the New York office. Um, was previously a mechanical engineer, you know, came up through the ranks in the design community and, and moved over to the ownership and development side, all within the hospital and laboratory um, design and construction community. So a little bit about Heinz, we're a global, very vertically integrated company uh, in 24 countries and many cities throughout the world. We handle investment management all the way through to property management. Um, asset management, construction management, um, about $140 billion in, in assets. It's a very much a family uh, felt type of firm um, where Jerry Hines has, has been involved since day one, unfortunately passed away this year, but that uh, family environment still lives on throughout the uh, company. Um, and sustainability has been ingrained with Hines ever since the beginning. We were founded in 1957 by Jerry. He was a mechanical engineer as well, so sustainability was at his core focus. Um, you can read all this on our sustainability report, but we've been a Sustained Excellence Energy Star uh, Award winner for the past decade. Um, and I think the middle quote is one that resonates most with me in that, you know, Jerry never believed in the status quo. It's, it, innovation is really just a state of mind. And I would say that innovation is not only a state of mind, but it's a state of optimism um, and open-mindedness. And then on the right there, we did a survey in 2019 to ask our tenants, what does sustainability mean to them? And what was interesting was that 75% of them said it was a healthy environment. You know, Half of them said it was a, a mission of their CSR goals and initiatives. Another 50% said cost savings and so on and so forth. So a little bit about the work that I do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, 
really Hudson Square Properties, which is situated in downtown New York, is comprised of three owners, one of them being Trini, who's a longtime landowner since the 1700s, um, Nordisk Bank, who I'm sure everyone's familiar with, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway, they're an equity partner, and then Heinz, we're an equity partner, as well as the operator, property manager, asset manager, to, uh, to run these buildings every day. And here's the 12 buildings, about 6 million square feet. They're all buildings that were built in the uh, Great Depression, except for one. Um, one of them is actually landmark or listed, as I think you guys call it on, on your side of the pond. Um, but they're these large concrete, you know, 17 story ish, uh, some of them are a million square feet um, buildings in downtown Manhattan. And most of our tenants are, are Tammy tenants, just in the advertising media and technology space. You can see here how Hudson Square is situated within, within New York. Um, it's scattered between West Village and the water. Um, and some of the tenants like Google, PepsiCo, Squarespace, all these very progressive media companies are starting to put a lot of pressure and make some very advanced and far-reaching forward-thinking climate goals. So for us, when the legislation came, came down in, in 2019, both at the city and state level, I think we really asked ourselves, you know, are we doing the best that we can? Um, and here's just a little bit sneak behind, uh, sneak peek behind the curtain. The dashed lines are the carbon intensity targets. So the horizontal line here is the target for New York City in 2030. And here's the line for the target in uh, 2050. And you could see that nine out of our um, 12 buildings are well above that target. Um, so we started on a mission to understand how we can move and better align ourselves with both the city and state and just our general uh, sustainability goals, both for, for Heinz and our tenants. I think it comes down to these five barriers that we've, we've seen in the marketplace. Uh, I say perceived risk because I don't think it's actual risk. It's the risk of doing anything um, that we've done other than what we've done before. <clears throat> Um, the lack of broad knowledge. For me, I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time with URBS and even in the Nordics. And there's a lot of misinformation in our marketplace on what the technologies are, what they can do, how low they can operate to. They don't work in big buildings. I mean, if, if I've heard it, uh, you can name it. Um, and then the system silos. Really, a more integrated approach is not the way uh, we approach projects. It's, it's very much in an efficient manner. So you know, the design engineer who's responsible for the design, there's an energy modeler who is responsible for the loads within the building. And then we have systems engineers who are responsible for the equipment that's designed to be implemented into those um, buildings. And none of them in that uh, competency stack really have the knowledge on the financial side in order to make the business case for a building. And then the cost of energy for us is around $3 a square foot, give or take. But we realize the cost of real estate is quite high in New York, you know, anywhere from $80 a square foot in rent. And the cost of employees is probably 10 times that. So energy efficiency measures sometimes get lost in, in all the underwriting within a project. And then the tenant landlord uh, sort of dysfunction, or I'll call it um, miscommunication. Really, the tenants don't have much say in the infrastructure that gets put into a building. So how do we close the gap? And when the tenant benefits, how does the landlord you know, push those benefits um, in a more equitable way? And with barriers, I always think there's opportunity. And one of the things that we've seen and worked very hard on is an integrated energy solution. So not our linear system of take, make, waste model. How do we provide a solution um, and reduce the amount of wasted energy within the building and uh, reduce our water use as well. Um, a lot of people are talking about battery storage, but we know the complications of mining and non-sustainable aspects of the hazardous waste at the end of life of those batteries. So for us, really thermal storage is key and how do we take that electrical energy and when it's being produced by renewables, store it within the building to be used as quickly as possible uh, back into the system. Then renewable energy production, I mean, solar panels have, have precipitously come down in cost as well as their efficiency gains, but in large tall buildings, they still don't make too much sense. So are there other ways to take that thermal storage 
and convert it back into electrical energy when it's needed during off hours, et cetera. And once we get the integrated system solutions and all those other aspects into play, it's really layering on digitalization and using the data we have in the building, not only from, I mean, we look at it in three ways, user experience, OT operational technology, and then energy efficiency. So how do we integrate our infrastructure to the health and well-being of the of the occupants. And then it's innovative financing, not using simple payback methods to determine whether a decarbonized future makes sense or not, but really lifting the barriers that we saw before in order to push um, the projects and financing along. And for us, our goals are really, you know, continue to be a leader within the industry. The definition of sustainability has changed quite a bit. I would argue that sustainability is probably not even relevant um, that much anymore. Who wants to sustain what we've been doing? We want to progress further than that. Reducing costs within the asset increases asset value, both for us and the tenant. Um, so doing that in an equitable way is, is really something that we strive for. And in the end, we're real estate owners. We're trying to provide a better, healthier, uh, more appealing environment uh, for our tenants. And a lot of this, those items have can be seen in a new building that hasn't been released to the market yet, but we'll find is that um, we're well ahead of the uh, New York City targets in using the same approaches that I've shown before. Um, and I, you know, URBS has been a big part of that, as well as the Heinz team and the local design uh, consultants. And then we partnered with NYSERDA. How do we take that knowledge in a new building and put it, in, it into an existing building, knowing that there's going to be much more disruption? Um, within that building, there's much more complications and uh, legacy of existing systems, fossil fuel burning systems. So we're currently underway uh, with that. And hopefully by February, we'll be releasing uh, just a master plan on how we get there and really looking for technology to progress that along as well. And then backcasting, looking at what is the most progressive sort of goal and taking these 1930 buildings, how do we make them net zero? We can make them very energy efficient, but how do we take them that extra step? I'll just leave on this uh, last slide, which I really love and probably overuse these days, but don't lose sight of the forest for the trees. Um, one single technology, we're trying to put this very complicated puzzle together, of financing, tenancy, uh, built environment, et cetera. Um, and there's many different stakeholders and how do we put that puzzle together? And it won't be one simple technology that, that does it, but it'll be an integrated, robust, holistic solution, which really moves the needle. So thank you guys for listening. And I'm going to pass it over to Connor from uh, RMI. Thank you, Mike. I'm just going to share my screen. Is everyone able to see my screen? Yep. Yes, good. yes. Great. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Connor Usri. I'm an associate on the buildings team at Rocky Mountain Institute, which for those of you who don't know is a nonprofit research and consulting institution. We're focused on accelerating climate change driven market and policy adoption. Uh, my team at RMI was able to work with NYSERDA to develop a database of technologies which can be used to decarbonize buildings in New York and beyond as part of the Empire Building Challenge process. So what I'll be addressing today are the project's objective and scope, some of the feedback from a variety of New York stakeholders, an overview of the database that we developed, and insights from the research process throughout. So under the contract with NYSERDA, we were given the opportunity to inventory, categorize, evaluate, and track different building decarbonization technologies that are uh, existing as specific barriers and we're trying to prevent, uh, um, or we're trying to allow for these tall buildings to achieve carbon neutrality. So for now, the database is a very specific intention. The work that my team has done stems from a need to assist the Empire Building Challenge participants. 
These real estate firms hold large commercial and residential buildings like Heinz in New York. And the hope is that the decarbonization retrofits of these tall buildings will serve as a guiding point and spur more decarbonization efforts in New York as a whole. So the broader vision of this work, which is still under development, is to build on this database and extend it into an extensive resource for a variety of different users. Uh, the database we see as being particularly applicable to a few different user groups. The primary focus will be on building owners who are looking for someone to vet new products. Design teams, especially engineering groups, uh, would look to the database as a singular resource for new technologies to implement. And lastly, for venture capital firms and accelerators, this resource would offer an unbiased investigation into the most promising technologies. For example, RMI has an accelerator offshoot called Third Derivative, and they're focused on supporting climate tech. And while they accept rolling applications, they would likely look to our database to consider companies or fields to invest in. So why did we focus on energy distribution and thermal storage for this iteration? We believe that both of these can be critical enablers and first steps towards carbon neutral building retrofits and that they're often overlooked in favor of more glamorous technologies. Uh, advances in energy distribution, for example, can reduce heat transfer losses and enable efficient low carbon heating and cooling sources. Uh, a great example is that electrification relies on equipment that's compatible with low temperature supplies like heat pumps and waste heat recovery. Uh, advances in thermal energy storage, on the other hand, can reduce equipment sizes and enable waste heat utilization, which can help to overcome electrical capacity constraints that exist in a lot of buildings in New York. Uh, thermal storage can enable demand flexibility as heating becomes electrified and has the potential to reduce uh, average daily loads and save heat for later in the day. So before we get into the database itself, I wanna talk a bit about some of the insights that we gleaned from the real estate partners and engineering firms that we consulted with. Uh, in addition to the standard barriers with operations like minimizing tenant disruptions and split incentives, we identified a few major barriers that exist in carbon neutral building retrofits. Uh, to talk about a few, we heard that there's limited space available for thermal storage or other additional systems. We were told that when shifting to electrified buildings that the electrical capacity at the building and local distribution levels can be a major barrier in some cases. And while that's obviously situational, it's something that needs to be considered. Designers, specifically engineers, we heard often were not incentivized to innovate and that's due to liability and compensation structures that exist in New York and the US in general. We also heard that there's definitely a need to grow local expertise. Uh, there are a few firms that have experience with carbon neutral retrofits in tall buildings in New York, but not enough for the market to evolve as a whole. Uh, economics are a primary barrier. Uh, and though energy costs and carbon penalty fines as a result of laws like Local Law 97 that Monica and Jared uh, were addressing before, uh, they're starting to drive more attention towards the efficiency needs as this energy becomes more expensive. Um, many folks are concerned that it is at the very least difficult to go beyond 80% electrification currently, since backup heating in New York is typically needed for the coldest days. Specifically on the database effort, we heard that carbon neutral retrofits are becoming a priority, which is great news. And while there are only a few leading firms, there's a great opportunity for knowledge sharing in order to establish best practices and approaches. We confirmed that real estate firms are often overwhelmed by vendor outreach and would appreciate a database like the one that we've developed uh, or from another third party to evaluate and filter through some of those products. One of the more unexpected things, and this is what Mike was actually just addressing, is 
we actually found that a lot of engineers and real estate owners would like to see design approaches and detailed case studies that don't just involve a, a single technologies brochure or spec sheet. And then one of the key reasons why um, real estate firms or engineers are worried about installing new technologies is that there's not enough proof that they work in buildings similar to their own in New York. Uh, lastly, that they would like to see the database expanded into different technology areas. So to dive into the content of the database itself a bit, uh, we collected a large swath of, of vendor data as well as ran a number of different analyses and calculations to categorize, validate, and organize the database into something that would actually be useful for the Empire Building Challenge participants as they decide on the best route to achieve carbon neutrality. Uh, we've highlighted a couple of the uh, important categories here. And while this isn't everything, we feel like it's a, a good uh, introduction to the database. So for the technology data, uh, we provided this in order to help users discern how ready the technology was for the market, what some of the key risks there were to deployment, and what barriers might prevent the scaling of the technologies in the marketplace. For applicability, the database was structured to be searchable by what sort of buildings and systems certain real estate groups would actually have in their portfolio. Uh, for example, if they were looking to retrofit a heating system, a user could filter by steam distribution with minimal tenant disruption and find the relevant technologies that we vetted. To address decarbonization specifically, we did a number of different climate impact calculations uh, specific to the potential for decarbonization in New York at a building level, as well as at a state level if they achieved a significant market saturation. We also evaluated their cost effectiveness potential for stakeholders who were looking to budget their projects. And lastly, we evaluated the technology's stage of growth and what reasons we deduced for their slow or fast adoption, since oftentimes building owners are weary of technologies with minimal installation examples. So after evaluating a few hundred products, we whittled down the list to uh, 64 initial technologies and four design concepts, which we believed were the most promising in the energy distribution and thermal storage realm. So I'm gonna talk about a few of those here. For energy distribution, the highest concentration of uh, hopeful technologies that we collected and believe are the most promise were in the zoned heat transfer devices, such as radiant panels, valence units, uh, chilled beams, and advanced fan coil units. Uh, outside of that, we saw a number of interesting additives and fluids which could be used in closed loop systems like surfactants for lowering the surface tension of water in order to minimize friction. Uh, while full decarbonization is going to require moving away from steam eventually, New York still has a large number of buildings with steam systems. So we incorporated technologies into the database like radiator modulation and better heat exchangers for steam systems. And lastly, we included technologies that supported local direct current power distribution, uh, ones that minimized domestic hot water recirculation and sealants for improved forced air HVAC distribution. On the thermal storage side, uh, many of the technologies that we in involved, uh, that we included involved uh, phase change materials. For those who aren't as familiar with PCMs, they are substances that absorb and release thermal energy during the process of transitioning phases, uh, usually between a solid and a liquid, and can be made up of a variety of different materials for different use cases. So we saw a lot of promise here. Uh, we saw phase change materials that could be incorporated into the building envelope to enhance the thermal inertia of the building, pumpable phase change material, which could be injected into thermal closed loop systems to carry energy at a higher density, uh, as well as phase change materials integrated into systems to capture waste heat directly. 
uh, while they've been around for a number of years, ice storage systems are starting to get more attention and adoption these days. And we found a number of products that have further refined their construction and made modifications to better fit distributed systems, which are gonna be important for buildings that have minimal space for centralized systems. Lastly, um, a few other technologies that we found that were promising included sewer waste heat recovery, thermochemical storage, and vacuum insulated hot water. Uh, so the point of this database overall uh, of this slide is to point out that there is quite a bit of innovation in the, the technologies that I listed here in blue, but outside of that, we're really looking for um, some innovations. So I'll touch on that a little bit here. Um, so we discovered and validated where we thought that innovation was needed. Um, and this was echoed by a number of engineers and designers and real estate partners that we spoke with. So in the energy distribution space, we heard that it's particularly hard to find products that specifically cater to retrofit projects. While there are often interesting technologies for new builds, energy distribution upgrades are gonna be pivotal uh, for existing buildings to achieve carbon neutrality. And with the exception of a few products like uh, easily installable radiant ceiling panels, for example, uh, it was difficult to find technologies that were minimally intrusive, which is gonna be key for not disturbing tenants that are already existing in spaces. Uh, waste heat is also a large issue for uh, tall buildings in New York, and there are not too many available solutions for moving this waste heat, uh, like how to integrate it with various energy sources and sinks throughout the building. Uh, as I said in the last slide, steam is still prevalent in New York buildings, and we weren't able to find a great solution for how to convert existing single or double pipe systems that are used today into more efficient forced hot water systems, which are installed in new buildings. And we think that that's would be a, a pretty major breakthrough in the space. Uh, the last thing that we want to see on the energy distribution side is uh, structural wall penetration systems that can be used to retrofit refrigerant or water piping. That way existing buildings can benefit from the increases in efficiencies that come as a result of better energy distribution in the space. For thermal storage, uh, we're always seeking products with higher energy densities and lower costs as well as innovative business models to monetize the waste heat in many New York buildings, uh, integration with passive systems like natural ventilation and thermal storage is integrated uh, into heat recovery chillers to better enable buildings to flex their energy demand. Um, last thing is in order to cut, overcome some of these broad market barriers, we'd like to see contract structures that better reward design and engineering teams so that they don't have to shoulder all of the risk for the installation of new technologies. Um, we would also like to see and hopefully facilitate some better collaboration all along the construction ladder from manufacturers to engineers to building owners. Thank you all very much. Um, while the database isn't publicly available yet, you can email the Empire Building Challenge team at this email address that's listed. And for more information about our research or RMI's efforts in general, please feel free to reach out to me uh, at my email address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Connor, and thank you, uh, Monica, Will, uh, and uh, Jared and Michael. I don't see any questions in the Q&A, so if you do have some questions, please send them to uh, us, the, the partners of UTechBridge, uh, at the end of the webinar. So since I don't see any questions, we will move on. And next we have uh, William Marin of Con Ed. Morning, Ben and everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. I will share my screen in a moment. Um, can you see my screen? 
Yep. Yep. Great. Um, well, so good morning, everyone. My name is Will Marin, and I am with Connaison's Energy Efficiency and Demand Management Pilots team. We, um, it's working through some, something here for a moment. Um, this morning, I'll give you a brief uh, overview of our company, our department, and more specifically about my team, which uh, develops and implements pilots that uh, demonstrate technologies or uh, delivery mechanisms uh, to bring uh, energy efficiency uh, programs to our customers. So Con Edison is one of the largest investor owned energy companies in the United States. Uh, our company provides a wide range of energy related products and services to customers through uh, subsidiaries, uh, including Consolidated Edison of New York, Orange and Rockland, Con Edison Transmission and Con Edison Clean Energy Business uh, businesses. Uh, Today, I'm gonna to talk specifically about Consolidated Edison Company of New York, which is uh, the company that I'm specifically working with and that provides uh, electric, gas, and steam service to New York City and Westchester. So about Consolidated Edison Company of New York or Seconi, we provide uh, electrical service, gas service and steam service to uh, New York City um, in different areas. Uh, electrical service we provide uh, to the entire city and Westchester County. Gas service we provide in Manhattan, Bronx, Queens and Westchester. And steam service we provide uh, only in Manhattan. Uh, we um, develop, we uh, operate and maintain uh, the, the distribution systems that deliver these uh, services to our customers. And we um, always looking for ways to um, uh, improve obviously the system, but also uh, deliver uh, uh, savings to our customers through uh, programs that I'm gonna talk about now. So um, specifically my department, Energy Efficiency and Demand Management offers customers energy efficiency programs that result in electric and gas efficiencies and peak load reductions. We provide uh, a wide range of, of programs that incentivize the adoption of uh, you know, energy efficiency measures, uh, regardless of the, the type of fuel it could be um, uh, for electric, for gas, or even steam. And we are um, obviously working towards the state and city goals um, that uh, Monica, uh, Jared, and a few uh, of my colleagues here have already uh, covered. We provide uh, energy efficiency programs uh, through uh, or for um, four different segments, commercial, industrial, multifamily, small and medium business and residential. And uh, we have a program that's, um, uh, we have programs that target uh, each individual segment and uh, can, um, or, or are intended to um, uh, achieve the goals that we uh, have uh, been given by our regulators and that are meant to uh, yeah, reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also um, yeah, um, uh, sorry, some, some problem here. So um, uh, let me talk a bit more about um, 
how the pilot's team is integrated into organization and uh, the role that we played in the, uh, in the department. So our role is to identify and evaluate new technologies and program delivery models that will eventually transition into our core programs. Uh, we develop uh, and implement uh, test environments for these technologies. And we uh, are looking to understand if uh, they're cost-effective, they're feasible and scalable. We source uh, or we look for technologies that uh, will deliver, uh, will deliver um, the fundamental goals in the years uh, ahead. Uh, we're looking to two or to four years in the future. Uh, our current focus is uh, new technology programs and delivery models that uh, that has been in, in our goal and or our focus for uh, quite some time. But uh, more specifically, we're looking for building envelope solutions. Like uh, also a couple of the, the presenters that have gone before me already alluded. Uh, new York City has um, a building stock that um, it's. Uh, uh, there's uh, a lot of room for upgrades and retrofits that uh, improve the building envelope and uh, allow these buildings to transition to um, zero emissions and well, in general just become more energy efficient. Uh, our pilots are also serving or looking to uh, target uh, low and moderate income customers. Um, so mm, what we're doing uh, to source ideas or what we're looking for is to uh, we're looking for proven technologies that deliver electric and gas savings, but also demand reduction. Um, and we're looking for innovative delivery channels. Um, just as an example, um, instead of uh, reaching out to customers individually, we um, are also implementing programs that uh, incentivize the distributors. So more upstream programs that uh, make it easier for customers to receive energy incentives and have access to energy efficiency solutions. The technologies that we're looking for are, could be physical or software. Um, obviously physical solutions are uh, probably more impactful, uh, but I mean, not always, not necessarily. And I've already seen that uh, some of the uh, technologies that have been presented uh, are very interesting. So looking forward to connect with some of you uh, or the other panelists after this meeting. Um, and again, uh, we're covering or we're looking for uh, technologies that target uh, all of our uh, customer segments. I'll give you an example of one of the technologies that we uh, have recently implemented. Um, this is a, well, the quantum water heater controller is a gas, uh, energy savings and demand management uh, solution. Uh, Aquanta learns and matches water heating and usage patterns and allows customer to uh, control their unit remotely, their uh, water heater remotely. It delivers gas energy savings and demand reduction. Uh, we tested this technology at 200 homes in Westchester uh, over the past year. And we're just about to wrap uh, or concluding the, the pilot and uh, draw some conclusions and understand uh, where to head next. But some of the objectives of this pilot included uh, the assessment of the actual uh, energy savings from the technology itself. We uh, tested the demand response capabilities uh, for a device providing gas uh, demand response, which uh, has not been done uh, at least at a larger scale or a relative larger scale in the past. So we're, we're quite excited about uh, testing uh, gas demand response capabilities. Uh, and we're also testing the, or one of the objectives was also to understand the cost effectiveness of this demand-sided uh, management measure. Um, and the customer experience, of course. A couple other pilots that we have implemented over the uh, in recent uh, time is the oil to electric pilot, which is an electrification effort to convert single family homes to th that are currently using oil or propane to clean heat alternatives. Uh, more specifically, this involve um, weatherization measures that 
uh, strengthen the, the building envelope in these homes or in these uh, uh, locations and uh, the installation of heat pumps for the space and water heating. So this pilot, uh, it's currently underway and uh, we're, yeah, we're working closely with uh, NYSERDA also on this uh, as we have similar offerings, but we're looking to uh, test it uh, in different ways to uh, better get information that we need to scale these programs up. Another pilot that's very interesting or a technology demonstration project that we're currently uh, working on is secondary window. Um, we have a couple of projects in the pipeline that uh, test or demonstrate the, the, the feasibility of implementing this technology in large buildings in New York City. Um, but what this consists of is uh, an attachment that goes uh, mounted uh, structurally on the existing structure and um, improves the insulating capability of the windows so that uh, these buildings become more airtight and therefore more energy efficient. Uh, implementing uh, a window retrofit in New York City could be quite challenging as you would imagine. So the secondary window solution uh, could be um, very beneficial and we're very excited about it. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Uh, another smaller uh, demonstration project that we have is uh, EcoBlade, which uh, I just wanted to add it here because it's a technology that uh, I think originated in um, uh, England or uh, yeah, in the UK, but um, we've been able to uh, pursue some projects here in New York City that demonstrate and we're able to uh, incentivize uh, the, 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 the demonstration of the technology and therefore uh, once we are able to uh, measure and verify savings delivered by it, we're able to incorporate into a larger programs. Um, so yeah, these are some of the examples of the projects or pilots that we're working on. Uh, and that's all I have for now. Happy to take on any questions. Uh, thank you, Will. I've just gotten uh, word that there might be an issue with our Q&A box. Uh, so if you have a question and you can't write it in the Q&A box, feel, please feel free to write in the chat and I will take it up there. Okay, I don't see any questions right now. So remember that you can always ask us later and we will try to pass them on to the panelists and get their answers back to you. So we will take a very short break now since we're running a little bit behind and uh, reconvene at uh, three o'clock uh, CET or I believe it is nine o'clock New York time. So two minute break, see you soon.
I see we're still missing one or two panelists, so we'll just give it another minute or two before we get started. And I was on mute, sorry about that. Uh, we're gonna jump back in now, starting with uh, Rebecca Zakowitz. So uh, Rebecca, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, share my screen. All right. Thank you everyone for joining this morning. My name is Rebecca Isaacowitz. I'm the Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Energy Operations. Um, a couple of folks from the state already covered a few of our uh, relevant slides. So I will go pretty quickly through our uh, routine introduction just to give you a sense of who we are and what we're looking to do. Um, and then talk more specifically about how to participate in our innovative demonstrations program. So as you heard, the city has very ambitious uh, reduction goals. This goes back to uh, the participation in the UN, uh, UN's uh, targets of 80 by 50. Um, we now have a more up-to-date uh, target of a 50% reduction by the year 2030 for government operations. So that's not building specific, that is sector holistic, um, but it is a very aggressive target. This is also on top of um, uh, work uh, that we further did previously around Executive Order 26, which said that not only are we adhering to the Paris Climate Accord, we're also going to further hold city uh, global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and that really intensified our commitments. We look to front load those emission reduction efforts. We are focusing on capping energy use intensity for our large buildings. Um, it's an additional 20% in deeper cuts by um, 2025. Um, it's an expansion of our expansion and launch of our deep energy retrofit. So as you heard from folks previously, we do have uh, quite a lot of concern around our existing building sector, but for buildings in which we are looking to maximize um, holistic renovations, those deep energy retrofits are really a soup to nuts approach to some of our largest buildings, looking to drive energy down by almost 80% in some of those spaces. Um, and then we're, we're advancing the procurement of 100% renewable electricity, some of which is now starting to coalesce in a really effective way. Um, so you heard a little bit about Local on 97 earlier from Monica. Um, this is part of a broader package of, of legislation called the Climate Mobilization Act. Um, and it requires, again, government operations to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So we've hit about a 30% emission reduction based off of our, our baseline year of fiscal year 2006. Um, but as you can see that there, there's still quite a bit of a way to go. Now we only have up to the year 2017 because of lags in uh, city uh, city data, but we know that we're, we're still on track to continue reductions, but. Um, obviously, 2020 was a little bit of an anomalous year for us. 
So um, to really jump right into it and not, <laughs> not a, um, overemphasize what's already been stated. So what is the Department of Citywide Administrative Services? DCAS is really the, the backbone of, of city government. We provide city services to other city agencies. So our clientele are other agency partners. Um, some folks in New York would have heard about us from civil service tests and um, large scale procurement, but we also manage the city's portfolio of, of facilities and real estate as well as handle large uh, real estate transactions and lease in lease out, um, as well as managing the city fleet. And then our office manages the city's energy use. So we've been around for well over 50 years at this point when DCAS was originally the New York City General Services Administration. And we're the centralized hub, for not only for utility billing, but also for demand side programming. So this speaks to that a little bit more. We handle that, that $700 million heat, light and power budget. We manage the installment of large scale clean energy projects, as well as helping support the procurement of 100% renewable electricity. And on the demand side, which is where I sit, we implement energy efficiency retrofit projects um, across the city portfolio on behalf of other city agency partners or in tandem with our city agency partners, as well as focus on operations and maintenance and um, city employee behavioral change management. Um, so again, supply and demand side with about 70 people on staff, and then we have about 80 city agency partners, which I think is probably most interesting to this group. Um, we, while we have 80 city agency partners, we work most closely with the top 20 to 22 agencies. And you'll hear for some of them after this presentation. Um, and we really are focused on their needs, right? We don't exist without them. Um, so that diverse array of programs is really speaking to their needs. Um, and then as you heard, I think from NYSERDA and RMI, we are, we're still hearing that need for a centralization of the hub of, uh, or a single point of contact as a conduit for um, both innovation and engagement. So we encourage um, vendors to come to us, um, not only to streamline the conversation across 80 different partners, which is an enormous amount of work, um, but also so that we can help best match some of the, the initi uh, initiatives that we're looking to execute together. Um, so it's a very diverse portfolio. It's a very large portfolio. Um, it ranges from you know 200 square foot conversations, which are basically public bathrooms, um, some of which are brand new. The ones that you see here on the left are our um, recent additions as part of uh, the Rockaway Beach um, refurbishment post uh, Hurricane or Superstorm Sandy, uh, all the way up to what you see on the right, which is a uh, um, CUNY University. Uh, historic building well north of a million square feet and certainly is not even in a campus style, a historic campus, not even close to some of our largest buildings. Um, uh, one of which is the building that I work out of, which is the Manhattan Municipal Building, um, almost 2 million square feet of, uh, you know, McKee, Mead and White space uh, built around the same time as City Hall. So um, this is a very large portfolio. It's about 250 million square feet. Um, that 4,600 buildings include schools, police precincts, firehouses, parks, as you see here, historic campuses, as you see here, um, other types of, of large spaces, um, wastewater treatment plants, stormwater facilities, and you'll hear from DEP in a little bit. So what's on our mind? <laughs> um, we're really focused on that targeted reduction goal. So we're, we're focused on holistic expense and capital strategic planning um, and large scale operations and maintenance plus uh, focus on labor and union initiatives. Uh, you heard from, you know, the folks on the private sector saying that uh, innovation is a, a frame of mind. We agree with that. Um, and we're really trying to think in a much more holistic way than typically uh, city government or government in general has been able to in the past um, to identify a portfolio by portfolio target of what they need to do or what that agency needs to do to reduce their uh, emissions to help the city meet its goals wholesale. Um, that also means then that applications of technology are more specific or more are necessary to be more particular on a agency by agency basis. And that's where that matching I spoke to earlier comes into play. Um, government operations strategy, you really, you know, for some examples include um, composting waste facilities on the sanitation side, um, DEP is water treatment and fugitive emissions. Um, DOT, we've done extensive street lighting work. And then, of course, I work with MOS and MOR 
uh, which is the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, is really speaking to that wholesale approach, right? We're not just buildings. This is much more than um, more than just a, a facilities management tactic or strategy that we need to focus on and apply technology to. And then finally, some of the innovative technologies and demonstration projects that we have done have really looked to streamline, we've looked to focus on streamline procurement. We've looked to focus on major stakeholder and programmatic parity, um, build nascent technology solutions, meaning working with the market um, before working, uh, where we previously only really worked with market ready solutions. How can we really help drive the market and, and share what it is that we need? That's through manufacturer outreach and, and uh, market challenges and to go really far beyond um, wholesale hard executions and into you know, so-called so GEB or um, grid, grid tied solutions with EV and distributed generation interaction. All of this is say, say is um, what we're looking to do is go well beyond investigation of just technologies and execute those technology demonstrations, but really look to tie all this together into a more um, holistic um, presentation of opportunity for our agency partners. So through the IDEA program, which is our innovative uh, innovative demonstration program that is uh, coalesced within the, our, my office, um, we've so far gone through four phases of technology demonstrations. We've looked at building controls, we've looked at energy storage solutions, HVAC optimization and renewable energy. And through those four phases, we've now tested 30 technologies in 50 buildings. Um, that's really not enough. Um, before I go there, um, that's really not enough. And we're now saying in lieu of us addressing phased approaches, right? In lieu of us saying, what's a problem and let's find solutions to solve that problem. We're now saying we have too much that needs to be done. We need, really need to push the envelope and we need to accept all solutions at any given time, seeing as how many of our buildings need multiple solutions to help them hit their targets. So now what we've done is go, we've moved away from this phased approach and we've said we are willing to intake any and all technologies that are interesting to the city of New York. Um, we will do that on a rolling basis. And on that rolling basis, we will review your technology, speak with you if it merits um, further investigation, and look to help match into um, one of our buildings. I will say from the perspective that we're setting now, because we need to do so much more, and particularly in what is now a very uh, funding limited environment due to our COVID response. We are solely looking at solutions that are uh, no cost solutions, meaning that the city is not is no longer able to pay for a solution. However, we will provide the structural uh, program management, uh, market market collateral development and measurement and verification of the technology to be able to say the city of New York says that this product does what it will say it will do. We will dedicate a program manager to that so that you as the vendor are led through the process, which is very, um, we have tried to streamline, but it is still a little thorny. Um, and we will work to match to the best agency partner wherever possible. Now to get a little bit more into the depths of how to navigate that program, um, I will we'll share a link to the IDEA program website where you can submit your technology, we're saying, just to give a sense of timeline, though of course it can be over under what I've shared here, we will respond and look to engage if the product is viable for us within two to four weeks. Um, we do have a little bit of backlog of interested vendors, but we're, we absolutely respond to everyone in some form or another. Um, if the city is interested in your technology, we would then reach out and discuss the needed parameters of the solution. You would tell us what is the best opportunity to demonstrate your technology and say, this is where it will optimally succeed and we because we want you to succeed we'll try and find a building that hits all of those check boxes that can typically take between one and three months depending on the complexity of the solution um, we go review our entire 4600 building set so it does take a little bit of time to do some of that matching um, but we're dedicated to ensuring the viability of the technology in our appropriate site so if we can find an appropriate site, we would enter into an agreement to demonstrate the technology. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. So you are entering into a contract with the city of New York. Um, you are not entering a, t a contract to buy your technology. You're entering a an agreement to demonstrate the technology. Um, typically that takes about three to four months to get off the ground, the, the contract itself. Um, 
which is significantly faster than the 18 to 24 months we've seen in the past. <laughs> um, however, just as a note that the contract terms of this demonstration are specific to this demonstration. If the product is deemed successful and um, demonstrates what it's, you say that it does, you would still need to enter into another contract where the city would then purchase your technology. The no cost demonstration is just for this specific one time demonstration opportunity. Um, I know that's a little uh, complex, but also happy to take any questions um, about that after the presentation. So once we enter to, uh, into a demonstration agreement, we will again manage and fund the measurement and verification for the demonstration and collateral development. Um, you can see examples of this collateral on the IDEA website where you would submit your technology. Um, and we now are in partnership with uh, the national laboratories, which are the federally funded national laboratories. So you are not only getting the depth of expertise that we have on our side, but also garnering a relationship that we have built with um, the federal GSA and the national laboratories, as well as the US Department of Energy, where we're trying to create programmatic continuity. Um, these relationships then also are helping to bolster the technology demonstration. Um, we're looking to create this, this uh, crosswalk of thought um, by having the national labs do the measurement or host the measurement and verification on our behalf. Um, finally, the demonstration period is typically 18 to, excuse me, uh, 12 to 18 months, which includes measurement and verification. At the end of that and once complete, there's a white paper that's produced on our side, a one pager that goes along with it, that the, that collateral is then circulated not only to our agencies, but also to our network. Um, we do some very aggressive networking to ensure that everyone and anyone who is involved with the work that we do on the demonstration side is aware of the work that um, we've done with you. Um, and then we post that on our website and that's typically within less than a month of completion, project completion. So I know there's a lot there, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, again, happy to take additional questions and then uh, just to kind of further flesh out, not only do we have this idea program, uh, we have that nascent technology uh, investigation that I had flagged earlier. We are challenging the market in conversations such as this, um, as well as putting out RFIs, which are requests for information to manufacturers. Um, I think that is probably beyond the scope of this group, but also happy to share with this network if, if interested. And um, you can find our information um, at the link below for this I the IDEA program and uh, solution submission opportunity. And if anyone would like to get in touch with me, I've included my contact information below. Um, and please feel free to do so. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for that great overview of how uh, vendors can get in touch with the city. Um, so now I will hand things over to Suzanne. And we will have a Q&A for this whole group of stakeholders from the city of New York uh, at the end just to kind of keep things streamlined. So Suzanne, the floor is yours. Great, good morning. Can you hear me okay, Ben? Okay, perfect. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me just get my presentation teed up here. <sighs> Sorry, I'm just, let me get this organized. It's an, my computer recently updated itself, and so nothing is ever where it used to be. Sorry, give me one more second. Why can't I? Okay, there we go. Hmm. That's interesting. Full screen right. mode, I think. Oh, thank you. Sorry. You're welcome. <laughs> Yes, perfect. Thank you for, thanks for the assist. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Suzanne DeRoche, Deputy Director for Energy and Infrastructure at the New York City Office of Resiliency and the Office of Sustainability. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our um, policy goals um, and what we're doing to meet some of those, uh, those goals and targets. So, the city has set a very ambitious goal of being carbon neutral by 2050. Um, and we look at that across a number of lenses, not just greenhouse gas reduction, but also how do we build a resilient um, and affordable uh, energy system. 
So I just want to set a little bit of context here um, so folks understand what the challenges that we have. Uh, so if we look at New York State here on the right, when we look at our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, about 45% are from buildings, but 36% um, uh, from transportation and um, waste and agriculture making up the remainder. But in New York City, we're a dense urban environment with a great public transit system. Our buildings are a huge part of our greenhouse gas emissions. And you just heard from Rebecca all of the things that we're doing with our own buildings in order to really tackle that energy efficiency um, and greenhouse gas mitigation issue. And then out of the building stock here in New York City, um, almost 40% of the, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions comes from the electricity used in those buildings. The rest is from on-site combustion of um, fossil fuels, mainly for heat and hot water. So a little bit different in terms of what the goals of the state is trying to do and what the goals that New York City are trying to achieve, just based on where the emissions are coming from. So I focus a lot on our energy supply, our bulk supply, um, and how do we get that to be um, carbon neutral, uh, which is a very high goal. You can see here in 2018, the electricity we consumed in New York City was majority fossil fuel, uh, with uh, followed by nuclear and then some hydro and renewables. However, our main nuclear power plant will be closing in 2022. And so you can see in 2022 that our fossil fuel uh, mix is now up to about 86%. Uh, some models show it as high as 90. So really, you know, this is a challenging issue specifically for New York City. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of our solutions there. So across these three pillars, um, we look at how can we utilize the space in New York City um, to increase distributed resources, mainly in the city that's solar and batteries. Um, and then what can we do to incentivize energy efficiency in the private sector, as well as um, on top of what we're doing in the public sector. And I won't talk too much about this today in the interest of time, um, but also how do we make these changes while increasing our resiliency to the impacts of climate change? So the first thing I'll talk about is energy efficiency. Um, the city passed a landmark set of um, green bills in 2019 called the New York City Climate Mobilization Act. Two tenets of that bill was Local Law 97. Um, this one for folks and tracking uh, what's happening in the US was a really big deal. Uh, we basically set a cap for large buildings um, on their greenhouse gas emissions, and then we will just decrease it over time. The first cap is in uh, 2025, followed by a cap in 2030, and then subsequently um, on a five-year cycle, those caps will decrease. So this is really the um, one of the main ways that we're going to see. You're going to see that decrease in the building sector uh, in terms of our emissions. We followed that um, in the same package of bills with a way to finance that is um, better for the building stock and better for owners. So we established PACE financing through Local Law 96, and this allows low cost clean energy financing that stays with the building rather than the owner. So it comes through uh, essentially a tax function. Um, and so that allows ownership of buildings to be passed, um, passed on while still having financing um, that allows for uh, green energy, uh, green, clean energy um, projects. And then the last piece of this is what we call the New York City, City Retrofit Accelerator. This program has been going for a number of years, and it's a service that the city provides to building owners to basically connect them to um, technical services and incentives uh, that exist to, to try to do energy efficiency in their buildings. Um, also passed in the Mobilization Act was Local Law 9294. This requires solar or a green roof or both on all new construction in New York City, regardless of the building size. So again, trying to aggressively move towards some of these targets you can see. Um, we're trying to reach 1,000 megawatts of solar by 2030. Uh, we have a little over 200 megawatts now. So we think we're well on our way. Um, and this bill will really help push 
that um, push towards those targets. We need this solar on buildings. We mainly see that as a way of decreasing demand from the buildings, not necessarily um, as part of our bulk supply um, strategies, but really to, to, to ensure that those buildings are using less of the grid power. The other piece is um, ensuring that we have um, a lot of battery storage. Some some modelings across uh, some modeling across the state right now has uh, close to 10 uh, gigawatts of solar. Uh, I'm sorry, of storage installed in New York City. It's a lot of battery storage to offset some of what we what is coming with offshore wind here um, on the East Coast. So we're really trying to ensure that the public and the development community understands how to permit storage in such a dense urban environment. You know, there are with lithium ion batteries, there are safety concerns from a first responders firefighter perspective. So we've been pushing out permitting guidance um, for the last couple of years to really try to ensure that that industry understands how to do business here in New York City. Another tool that we have um, for the development community is, is our um, community energy planning online mapping tool. Um, and essentially, I'm just going to flip to the next slide here. This gives you, from the development community, a perspective on where we think certain technologies will work in the five boroughs. So what we're looking at here is the ground source heat pump feasibility on a block basis. Um, and then we have all of these other categories like energy cost burden. So this is how much of folks paycheck is going to their energy bill. And what you see here in the darker blue, that means those folks are paying well beyond our target. And so their energy costs are really eating up a lot of their um, expendable income. So we overlay that with solar as a way to show the development community that these would be good places for people to really take advantage of low cost solar uh, to help decrease their bills. So this is a public tool. Um, and you know, if you just look up, just Google New York City Community Energy Planning Tool, it'll pop right up. Feel free to, to ask questions about that um, later. The last thing that I'll talk about is how do we get the bulk system to be um, more to be greener in New York City. So what you're seeing here is a map of New York State. Those red dots are places where we have transmission congestion. So the upstate grid um, above those dots is really clean. In some places, 80, 85 percent clean. Uh, but that trans that can't get through these bottlenecks of transmission down to New York City um, down at the bottom here. So these blue lines are modeled new transmission um, that we've taken a look at. Um, that will bring clean energy uh, down into the downstate region. So we can harness the upstate onshore wind um, and hydropower, as well as the New York State's planned um, offshore wind. And we think that if we, you can see the numbers there on the side, if we um, get all of those resources, we can get to about a 60% clean electricity grid in 2030. Coming from a place in 2022 where we're at 85%, approximately 85% fossil, we think that that's doable. Um, it's a short amount of time, but we don't have a lot of time to solve this climate crisis. So uh, we're pushing hard to ensure that those transmission projects move forward quickly. So that's all I have today, Ben. I unfortunately am gonna have to jump off in a few minutes, um, but if there are any follow-up questions, please feel free to email me. You see my email address right there. Perfect. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, and we will jump right into the next presentation. And uh, Jennifer, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, I'm having a little trouble sharing. It says I cannot share maybe till Suzanne is not sharing. Aha, that might work. Okay. Um, is that working? Sorry about that. No problem. Let's see what happens. Can we see this? Yeah, it looks good. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm with the city's Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk quickly about what we're doing uh, for energy and carbon neutrality. As both uh, Suzanne and Rebecca mentioned, we are one of the agencies that um, are committed to these goals uh, that are citywide. 
A little bit about DEP. We're the largest combined water and wastewater utility in the US. These are the stats of our staff and the scope of our work. Uh, we provide both clean drinking water and treat wastewater uh, for all the five boroughs. I'm part of the Office of Energy and Resource Recovery Programs. This, provide, this slide provides an overview of the work that our office does. We're a small group, <laughs> but we uh, have our hands in a number of things that have been discussed today. Uh, I personally focus on the resource recovery portion, um, biosolids and the intersection of organics and energy production. We have these targets, as I mentioned, that many have talked about today, uh, that we are examining how we can apply those to our work at DEP uh, and what projects we will need to undertake in order to meet uh, these targets. Uh, our agency is actually the second largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the city uh, and the third largest energy consumer. So uh, we're a big part of the citywide goals. We realize that, but we also see that uh, we're a large source of opportunity. In fact, some of the clean energy that Suzanne was mentioning upstate is from um, hydroelectric power installed in our watershed system where uh, the city's clean water comes from. From a greenhouse gas reduction perspective, we have a four-prong strategy um, that overlaps with many of the concepts and technologies that have been talked about today. We're looking at conservation and efficiency on the demand side, um, finding ways on the supply side to make that supply greener, um, on-site energy generation using anaerobic digester gas is one of the largest parts of our strategy. Um, also looking at fuel switching and electrification. We do more traditional renewables as well. We have solar at a couple of our facilities and are looking to install um, more solar right now. We've taken a look at uh, geothermal as well as sewer thermal um, on our effluent and so this is an area, if there are folks who have technologies in this space, um, we'd be interested in learning uh, more about them. And as mentioned, I'm focused on biosolids and the potential that that source has from a carbon perspective um, to be offsetting uh, from our emissions when we manage to beneficially reuse those solids and get them um, back to land. So the vision for DEP is, is to become a sort of center in the circular economy by taking in um, discarded resources from the entire city and recovering various valuable um, elements from them, whether it's electricity, um, production of clean water, biosolids, as I mentioned, or even um, next generation products such as elemental phosphorus, those are all things that we're, we're looking at as part of our planning. Um, here's a few sample projects, a couple of them that I've mentioned. Um, we do have cogeneration. We have 14 uh, treatment plants uh, dotted around the city. You can see them here on the map. Um, three of them have cogeneration systems. The one highlighted here is at our North River plant which is up here in Manhattan on the west side. Um, and we're putting in 12 megawatts um, of cogeneration um, capacity at that facility. And then as the solar that I mentioned, this installation is a, a picture of one of our facilities um, in Port Richmond in Staten Island. We have um, another installation on, on Wards Island. So we do have a distributed network um, of facilities with potential at many of them. Um, and Newtown Creek is uh, are one of our <laughs> more iconic facilities where these digester eggs um, live. We have eight of them. Um, they're three million gallons each, so a very large facility. Um, and we are doing a number of innovative projects at that location, um, including a biogas to grid project and uh, co-digestion of food waste uh, for additional biogas production. I'll speak a little bit more about that food waste project because it's an area um, where we are hoping to see additional um, likely private investment or application of technology, particularly on this middle step that I've um, circled. And that is in order for us to co-digest um, 
organic feedstocks at our wastewater plants, they need to be pre-processed and cleaned up. So contamination needs to be removed and they need to be made into a slurry so that we can feed them in with our liquid waste stream. Um, there's really only one company doing that here uh, right now in the city and that's waste management. So we're working with them, but obviously there's a lot more food waste um, that's out there and needs to be cleaned up, collected and processed in order to uh, harness the renewable energy that's embedded into it. In it. Um, Biosolids remains kind of my favorite thing. So I had to put in um, some specific information about this. And I did note uh, in the prior presentation in the chat, there was a large discussion about biochar and making biochar out of biosolids. That's something that I'm watching very closely. Um, there are four projects in the uh, sort of tri-state area geography looking to install pyrolysis or gasification for the treatment of um, biosolids in particular. Um, so there isn't any local production of biochar from biosolids yet, um, but there are a number of companies innovating in this space and trying to get it off the ground um, because it does create that renewable syngas uh, energy as well as result in a large volume reduction. It's, a, it's very interesting um, for the city because we make a tremendous amount of biosolids, about 1400 wet tons a day or 50 to 60 truckloads. Um, so this is something that uh, we're taking a very close look at as part of our energy and carbon neutrality plan uh, for the agency. And we, one of the goals that hasn't been talked about as much today, but is included in the citywide goals is a zero waste goal. And we've adapted that to our biosolids. So we're hoping that by 2030, uh, we no longer have any biosolids going to landfills. So to sum up, um, we are working on an agency energy and carbon neutrality plan. So a roadmap of how we're going to achieve those goals. We're one year into this three year planning project um, and that's gonna take us out to 2050. This isn't our final product, but it's kind of a look forward is what we think um, might transition us to that, to that place uh, where we're meeting those greenhouse gas and energy neutrality goals. Um, by diversifying, sequestering, and implementing new technologies. So that's my information, uh, and thanks for having me join y'all today. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And now we have our last presenter of the day. So uh, Mickey, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, can anybody hear me? Yeah. Great. So this is um, kind of switching gears to what um, everyone was talking about today. Um, our work in the green infrastructure program is primarily about stormwater management. So I'll just talk a little bit about what we've been doing and the new opportunities that we're hoping will arise going forward. So as was mentioned before, um, DP provides the, all the water uh, services for all of New York City. And our program has largely been focused on the combined, excuse me, on the combined sewer areas of the city, which is about 60% of New York City. Um, and our primary focus up to date was um, in the outer boroughs, just because of the land opportunities. And there's really, um, very little space in Manhattan where we can construct some of the practices that we want to to manage stormwater. And here are some examples of the types of green infrastructure that we've been implementing. So our focus is to do nature-based solutions in a distributed manner. Um, so while the last presentation was about the wastewater treatment facilities, we're trying to reduce the load on the sewers by implementing these nature-based solutions on a regional scale. So the top are some images of typical uh, practices that we've been implementing in the streets and the sidewalks. And the bottom two are examples where we've either worked with our public property um, 
owners or some private property owners to implement some type of practice that works for their uh, use of the space um, or uh, or we um, work with them to figure out how they can meet their stormwater requirement rules. So here's a breakdown of the typical, um, of actually how we've been doing so far. This is from our 2019 report. So you can see that primarily we've been focused on the public right away because our agency can implement directly onto those properties, but we are anticipating that the private property implementation will be a key part for our program to uh, meet our water quality goals. Um, so yeah, you can see that it's very, very uh, skewed towards right away currently, but we really need the private sector to implement the stormwater management practices in order for our agency um, to be able to uh, meet our mandate. And here's some examples of uh, what how we refer to the to the green infrastructure solutions. So what we've been implementing our right of way, which are vegetated practices. Uh, we also have been looking at permeable pavement. We have some things called infiltration basins, which are not vegetated. So there are subsurface practices that capture stormwater uh, beneath the surface. And we're also doing detention systems. Um, Glade roofs, so you know all the usual stormwater management technologies. And in terms of the public property partners, we've worked with the parks department, we work with schools, um, housing. We are also working with uh, the fire department and the police department to retrofit some of their buildings. With uh, usually it's green roofs. Um, but we're also trying to expand our portfolio to larger projects and new innovative projects, such as uh, um, the Tibbetts Brook Daylighting Project. We're also trying to uh, figure out how to incorporate stormwater reuse as a way to mitigate the stormwater runoff and the stormwater that enters our sewers. Uh, we're also trying to um, combine some of our efforts with uh, flood mitigation programs. So what I think um, in the Netherlands is also called cloudburst. We're trying to implement those types of practices. And lastly, we also want to do larger projects in the roadways uh, through the meet these median projects where we're redirecting flow from multiple streets into uh, one area within the street. And lastly, so here's the private property, um, our program. And like I said, this is a really key part of, for us to be able to meet our stormwater requirements. Um, up to now, we've had some, a grant program that has been uh, basically paying back a private property owner who implements um, some type of stormwater management practice within their property. Um, that's now a green roof incentive program. So um, if you implement a green roof, we'll, we'll pay for that as a, uh, we'll pay for that on a square foot basis. We're also in new starting a new program called the Private Incentive, Incentive Program where we're working with a third party administrator and they're gonna be targeting large property owners to implement some type of green infrastructure practice within their property. So we're not directly, um, designing or constructing the green infrastructure for that, the third party administrator will be handling all of that. Some other work that we're doing is, um, as was mentioned before, I think Suzanne mentioned, we're working uh, with the, the solar um, and the green roof initiative through the local law 9294. And lastly, the stormwater regulations, which I mentioned before, so, so far we have the MS4 and the 2012 stormwater rule. These have these are separate rules, depending on whether you're in the combined area or the separate area. Um, and these get triggered whenever there's new development or redevelopment on a certain threshold of land. But we're actually trying to uh, change that requirement into a unified stormwater rule for this, the, for all of New York City. So what we're trying to do is incentivize um, only retention projects, whereas uh, 
up to now, most private property projects have been detention based. So it goes into a tank and then it's slowly released into the sewer. So we're trying to focus on retention only projects and if they need to um, do detention because of certain types of space constraints or other you know, land usage or um, something what's wrong with the soil, then it's a very strict uh, slow release requirement. So um, we understand that you know New York City is extremely constrained and, and the opportunities for any new building or any existing building to be able to capture and basically infiltrate the water into their property is extremely difficult. And we're hoping that there'll be some innovative technologies, um, including reuse projects or filtration projects that will help the private property owners meet the new requirements that we're proposing through this rule amendment. Another big part of our program is maintenance. So because we have so many types of green infrastructure practices throughout the city, um, you know, it's, uh, it's an ongoing, um, this financial requirement for us to be able to maintain, and not just our agency, any agency who has these projects they have a continuous need to be able to maintain these properties. So we're always looking for new ways to reduce the maintenance requirements. Um, and for mentioned biochar, that's something I think a lot of other cities are looking at as a way to um, improve the plant health and reduce the plant health, reduce the plant maintenance requirements. And you know, the same is gonna apply for all the private property owners who are gonna be implementing these types of stormwater practices on their property as part of their regulation. And here's some other work that our group is doing. Um, these aren't directly related to the green infrastructure, store, the green infrastructure program, but it ties uh, directly into the water quality goals that we're trying to meet. So um, there's wetland restoration projects. We're doing uh, water quality pilots through oyster and mussel activity. We're also, um, like I said, we're trying to tie some of our efforts with the flood mitigation work. Um, so we are hoping that you know we can we can build out new types of technologies that will manage more stormwater for less maintenance requirements. And here's some additional information. So uh, these are links to uh, that to show the specific types of practices that we've been constructing so far and the way we've been implementing them. And these are great resources um, if you wanna see if anyone's interested in the stormwater management sector. And that's it. Thank you so much, Mickey. So now we have some time for uh, any questions. If you have a question, please write it in the Q&A box or in the chat and we will take it up now. So I'll leave uh, a minute or two in case anybody has any questions for these uh, four stakeholders we've heard from just now. Okay, then we will move on. Remember that you can always reach out to us on the TechBridge team and we will try to answer your questions. And we will also uh, have the presentations available in case you need some details. So now I will pass things over to Scott Allison, also from the TechBridge project, and he will uh, give you some more information about the next steps here. You're done. You should all be able to see my slides, but um, yeah, thanks for all the speakers today. It's been very interesting. Um, a lot of good inputs and hopefully it's a good starting point for this kind of engagement with these end users in North America. Uh, just quickly, I know it's been a long session, but just quickly to state the next steps, uh, a bit about this online platform and yeah, how we'll be moving forward with this uh, during Q1 uh, next year. Uh, so basically as Ben presented in the start, um, this is uh, this, the whole program is about supporting EU SMEs to engage in North American, the North American markets, uh, together with North American end users. So the next step will be that um, uh, SMEs on the webinar here, plus additional ones, 
will need to kind of register their interest in the potential matchmaking opportunities. This will be available on our website, which should hopefully be ready by the end of the week, uh, and also on our online platform, which I'll explain in a minute. So this is a simple form just to express your interest to and which kind of end users you're interested in. Uh, these uh, registered SMEs will then be kind of listed uh, and presented to North American uh, some of the speakers today uh, and there'll be a kind of selection process that will be uh, gone through to basically match up who will be having these facilitating one-to-one -one meetings that will be virtual during Q, Q1, Q2 next year. Uh, and as Ben mentioned, uh, the further along the line there is potential for travel support uh, for selected SMEs and this will be obviously further explained once you get through into the selection process. Um, just also that there will be other kind of activities, other end users in North America, uh, in New York, in Northeast that we're kind of exploring at the moment. So there'll be other kind of uh, recruitment web webinars like this. So this is not just, this is just the start. This is, uh, so we have many more coming. Um, the online platform, just quickly, uh, we have set this up. Uh, you'll be get all this information via uh, email will be sent out after this uh, webinar this week with uh, all the information you need for the kind of next steps. But we have this online platform where we'll have this kind of community space um, uh, for the EU Tech Bridge project where all the opportunities kind of presented today will be visible. Uh, all the new opportunities will go on there and you can see which other SMEs and organizations are interested in these different projects. Uh, so you can get an overview. There'll be a community kind of page there. Uh, you'll hear about other upcoming activities automatically. You'll be updated uh, whenever there's something new happening. Uh, and also you can find the application forms to register your interest in the matchmaking activities. As I said, all this information will be sent through to you uh, this, this coming week uh, with links to the website, etc. And as Ben mentioned, any questions, uh, please do, do not hesitate to kind of reach out to any one of the partners uh, uh, here today. And I hope everyone else, um, I hope it's been a good and useful session for everyone. Um, I don't know, Ben, if you want anything else final to say before we wrap up. Just thank you again to all of the panelists. We really appreciate you taking the time to help us understand what your needs are. And we're looking forward to uh, continuing to work with you in the coming months. So thank you and Goodbye. yeah. Thank you. Hey, thank you to all of you. Thank you to the speakers and to the attendees. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, I think that I'm going to finish the, the webinar. I think that is possible to finish, no? <laughs> yes, you're right. There are some people connected, but I'm going to finish. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. So See you in the, in the next meeting. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.